thank you guys so much for for having me and for being here. I've actually been here for a couple of days. So I've been doing this and I've met a lot of you and it's been really cool to hear about the work that you guys are doing and how passionate you are about it. And it's been fun to hear uh, the other authors. This is the last event, so I feel like I feel like what we're gonna really try to do today is just make it so that when you leave here and you get to the airport and your bag is like 15 pounds overweight from all the books they've got, we're just gonna make sure you just remember this face and you keep my book in your bag, all right? I don't wanna get to the Southwest counter and see like a stack of my books, that would be so sad. All right, so my book, which again, you're gonna keep it in your bag, it's called, uh, it's not up there anymore, it's Bones, Brothers, Horses, Cartels, and the Borderland Dream. And I'm a journalist by trade, so this is a true story, and it's based on hundreds of interviews, thousands of pages of documents, and a few very unlucky trips to the racetrack. Um, it's nonfiction, but it's filled, I think, with, with some really interesting characters who face some really interesting choices. There is an immigrant working class college student who has to decide between continuing his studies in the States and going across the border and working, doing very lucrative work with horses. There's a young rancher who uh, has to decide basically whether or not he wants to risk his life and his family's business to become an, an informant for the FBI. And there are dozens of these young Mexican and Mexican-American horsemen who have to face this choice that a lot of people in Mexico face, and it's not really a choice at all. It, it's what do you say when somebody comes around and you think that they work for a drug cartel and they ask you to ride or to train or to breed their horses? Mostly I want to talk to you today about one guy who faced one of these choices. His name is Jose. And I first heard about Jose in 2012. I was reading the newspaper and I came across a story about this dramatic raid on a horse farm in Oklahoma. Dozens of federal agents had swooped in and seized 400 horses, uh, some of them worth upwards of a million dollars. And the horses technically belonged to this guy, Jose, who was a father of four and a rancher and kind of a pillar in this small Oklahoma town. But according to the government, the horses and the ranch and the whole operation actually belonged to Jose's baby brother, Miguel, who was in Mexico and one of the leaders of Los Zetas one of the most feared criminal organizations in the world. So, uh, you know, I was intrigued. Um, and I did what journalists often do in that situation. I called up the government and I asked them about it. And they, as they sometimes are, they were eager to tell me about it. And they introduced me to the agent who had led this raid. He was this young, strapping FBI agent, like straight out of the movies. And his name was Scotty, and he was from Tennessee. And he had spent two years infiltrating the American quarter horse industry to prove that Los Zetas were, were using that industry to launder their drug money. And so this story started to form in my head. Uh, and the climax of the story was that scene at the ranch with, with Scotty you know, racing onto the ranch to find the drugs and the guns and the horses, which is weird, but it's part of the story. And that's how these stories get told, right? College educated straight white male journalists like me want to tell a story about the drug war because it sounds cool. So they go find other college educated straight white males to tell them the story. And this, and this kind of vicious cycle ensues. And, and we see it you know, in our local daily newspapers with the cops posing proudly next to the stacks of drugs. And we see these heroic DE agents hunting the bad guys through the pages of our glossy magazines. And we see these kind of cartoonish, naive white agents like kind of tr tripping over bodies in shows like Narcos. <sighs> Luckily, as I started this story, I started to kind of recognize that I was lugging some of these biases to the process and that I was as at risk as anybody is of falling into this sort of destructive narrative cycle. And so, I, I tried to, as best I could, widen my lens. And in that moment at the ranch, I tried to sort of uh, broaden out and find Jose, who was, as Agent Scotty was sort of bursting out of the ranch, Jose was sitting on the lawn with his wife in their pajamas, handcuffed, watching their American dream just be sort of boxed up and loaded onto trailers. 
And Jose, when you looked at Jose was the story. I just had to find him in the frame, right? So Jose was born not that far from here in Nuevo Laredo, just over the border. His dad worked in the fields. And when his dad was doing that, you could cross easily and legally into the United States, work here, work your butt off, make your money, go back to Mexico, support your family, support your local economy. By the time Jose and his 12 siblings needed to go get work, that deal was up. Immigration was being politicized. That easy economic migration wasn't a thing. Towns like Nuevo Laredo were devastated and were falling more and more under the control of these smuggling organizations. So when Jose came, he came illegally, and he came for good. But he found work. He found work laying bricks in Dallas. And his brothers did too. And his whole family just came, or a lot of them. They started to build the kind of rickety foundations of an American life. And they bought houses, and they got jobs, and they uh, took care of each other's kids, and they relied on each other in the way that a lot of families do, but in the way that immigrants' families especially do as sort of a defense against the hardships of life as an outsider in this country. So they did that, but it's hard still. Laying bricks in Texas is really hard. And one by one, Jose's brothers kind of got sucked back into the world of their hometown. One brother went to prison 20 years for dealing marijuana. Did 20 years in Colorado. By the time he got out, weed was completely legal in Colorado. Two of his brothers were eventually killed, and two of them started to rise the ranks of the gangs, including Miguel. Jose stuck it out. He kept laying bricks. He got a job for a contractor that built beautiful high schools and universities, and even helped build Cowboy Stadium, the new Cowboy Stadium, the shiny one. Um, and he got married. He married a fellow immigrant. They became American citizens. They bought a house together. And they just they held fast to this American dream. And they never fell into what was a very real temptation to, to, to be in business in some way with his brothers. And around 2009, they reached this kind of crucial point. For any immigrant family, his oldest daughter, he had four kids, his oldest daughter, Alex, graduated from high school and decided that she wanted to be the first in this extended Trevino clan to go to college. And look, he'd been working all this time. They didn't have any money, so it was not clear how they were going to pay for it, but she was going to go. So it was at this exact moment, back in, in Mexico, Miguel has become obsessed with quarter horse racing. Quarter horse racing, if you don't know it, it's like a shorter, faster, more violent version of the kind of horse racing that you and I like accidentally watch on Sunday afternoons on NBC like four times a year. So that's thoroughbred racing, that's the sport of kings, and this they call it the sport of cowboys. That's getting drunk off mint juleps and wearing big hats and betting, and this is getting drunk off Corona lights and wearing big hats and betting. Um, they're similar, but they're different. And quarter horse racing is huge in the American Southwest and in Northern Mexico. And so Miguel would typically just run his horses, he would buy them in the States and then run them against his fellow drug traffickers or ranchers, and they would let him win because it was bad if they didn't let him win. And, and that's what he would do. But around this time, he had one horse that he wanted to run in the United States. It was really fast. And it was small, and it was skinny. And so they called, the guys in the barns called him huesos, which is, means bones. And he could, the horse could fly. So Miguel ordered them to, he ordered his guys to smuggle the horse back across the border, ride him across the river, find a, a barn in Texas, and enter him into a big race in Dallas. And he asked his brother, Jose, the clean brother, to be the owner of the horse. So choices, right? It's a big choice. And it's the most interesting of the ones in the book, because what do you say? What do you say when your brother, the, the drug lord, asks you for a favor that doesn't involve moving drugs, it doesn't involve moving money back across the border, and it will, for the first time, after 30 years of laying bricks, at this crucial moment, offer your family a financial foothold in this country that you like, really want to call home. So I wrote the book, so I don't have to tell you what Jose chose. I'll tell you, Huesos won that first race, set a track record, won hundreds of thousands of dollars, broke his own track record in the next race, won hundreds of thousands more, and Jose in due time owned some of the fastest horses in the business, some of the most prestigious titles, some of the best breeding horses, 
And he bought that ranch in Oklahoma, and he moved not just his wife and his kids, but his mom and a brother, and they all worked on it. And his neighbors said it was the best the ranch had ever looked. And they, they started to build like real power and wealth in this sport and in this industry that kind of prouds, prides itself on being multicultural, but like a lot of the institutions that pride itself on being multicultural is actually dominated by generationally wealthy and powerful white people. And they, didn't, they did not love that. And the FBI started coming around. So they did the investigation, they do the raid, and, and the result of that investigation, I think, is sort of one of the key takeaways of the book. It's, um, it's a testament, I think, to the, the sort of systematic, unconscious, sometimes unconscious biases that entrench power and wealth and fuel the drug war and perpetuate the inequality that plagues this country. The FBI, in the end of this thing, indicted 18 people. All of them were Mexican or Mexican-American. Drug money had touched every corner of this industry, top to bottom. But every person they indicted was Mexican or Mexican-American. It included Jose, of course, Jose's wife, and even Jose's daughter, who the government said had known about Jose's business and hadn't reported it. Miguel, the guy they really wanted, they, they want Miguel. But he's in Mexico. He's untouchable. So you can't do anything about that. So it's an interesting story. What does it have to do with these kids who you care so desperately about? You know, a lot, I think. I think you know, it's a contemporary story. It's, it, it recently happened. It's still happening in a lot of ways. It's also a history story. It's a history of, of this very land that we just kind of took and called Texas. Uh, it's a history of the drug war, this drug war that fueled record violence in Mexico last year. And, and saddles us with the highest incarceration rates in the developed world. And, uh, it's, a, and it's a story about, um, about industry, I think, you know, uh, including a lot of industries that, you're, that your students will consider, law enforcement, banking, um, agriculture, journalism, it goes on and on. Mostly, to me, though, I think about it in terms of when I think about it from your perspective as a story about how we tell stories and how the the sort of dominant na narratives in our culture um, determine how power and agency and opportunity are divvied up in this country. College, and, and I've talked to some of you guys about this, like college is so much of it is about the stories that we tell ourselves and, and tell each other and the stories we consume. And what I hear is that a lot of students can't find themselves in the stories. Or, and I've heard this more, is that they, they do know themselves from the stories, but then they get to campus and they have this new menagerie of classmates and they can't, they don't recognize their classmates from the stories that they've been consuming. And, and it sounds like it's causing a lot of conflict on campus. So when I, when I think about the book for you guys, what I, I think and what I hope is that if students one day found themselves reading the book, that they could find themselves in the book or find their classmates in the book and that that would challenge them to find and consume and eventually, as storytellers themselves, tell more diverse and more nuanced stories and truer stories. Um, got time. I've got two little kids. They're not going to college. I, I'm honestly not sure that I want them to go to college. I think I just want them to live with me forever because they're small. They're still at that age. But if they go, I am honestly super comforted by the fact that you guys or people like you will be there like waiting for them to make them feel safe and to put a book in my hands, because nobody did that for me. I was playing like Wii. And so for you, that you guys will be there is very, very nice to know. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>